Okay, hello, I am back. Um, I have gotten some more comments on a couple of the videos, the last one and um, a, one a couple days back. Um, I appreciate the comments. Um, and I've also gotten like text messages and phone calls about it. Um, I'm not by any means losing faith in God. Like I know who God is. I know Jesus Christ is my Lord. I am just conflicted because I just don't understand. And maybe it's like one of those mysteries that, um, sorry, for those of you who don't know anything I'm talking about, go watch my previous videos. <laughs> um, I am just conflicted. I just don't understand how to have complete and utter faith and completely believe for something when in the back of my head, like in the back of my mind, I'm like, yes, I'm believing for this. I know God can do this. Um, I'm believing for it to happen. But then in the back of my head too, I'm like, and, and, in this, and even it's in the same prayer, you know, like, God, please do this for me. I believe that you're going to do this for me. I'm, you know, like you, you can do it. I know you're going to do it. Like, but your will be done, but your will be done. So am I, am I not a hundred percent believing in, like I a hundred percent believe that he can do these things that I'm asking for, but am I not a hundred percent believing that he's going to do it if I'm praying his will be done? Because what if that's not his will to be done? And I feel like, um, this is maybe like when I was talking to my mom, maybe this is more along the lines of like, um, like the natural things, um, and not necessarily like decisions or choices you're going to make because in that I can see God, please, you know, like praying, God, please guide me or open my eyes to what your will is. Um, that I may pray your, that your will be done. I mean, I guess that could be in both things, like open my eyes and open my heart to what your will is. Maybe that's more of a prayer. Um, but then that does, then that does that mean that I lack faith? If I am praying and I, I don't feel like I lack faith, but I, I just reading these stories and it just seemed like they had like the utmost faith, like they believe for that miracle. Like, no, God, you don't have to go see my servant. Just say the words and he's going to be healed. And so was he, what if God said, no, I'm not going to say the words. I don't, you know, or like when he went to go raise the daughter from the dead, what if God's will was for her to stay dead? Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I guess what ifs, what ifs, everybody's got what ifs, right? Um, anyway, so that's where I am with it. And it's not that if God doesn't answer my prayers, I'm any less faith faithful because I know that God answers in his own time and God answers in his own way. Mm -hmm. And God's will may not be what I'm thinking or what I'm wanting for, or what I'm praying for, or what I'm believing in. So I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't lose my faith for that. Like I heard, um, I heard on the, the radio yesterday, I think I was listening to Celebration Radio out of Modesto. Um, I think, I, I don't even know who it was, if it was the, I don't think it was the DJ, but it was one of those blurbs that those little, you know, snippets that they put in there. And that he talked about um, all, all these horrible things happen or whatever, but how can you still be faithful after all these horrible things happen to you? Like all, after all the stuff that you've been through. And he says, because my faith isn't circumstantial. Like it's not based on circumstances. It's not based on, it's not based on God, I prayed for this, but you didn't answer it in the way that I wanted you to, or, um, God, I believed that this was going to happen and, and it's not, or, or all these awful things happened to me. So now I don't believe you. No, my faith is in God. My foundation is on God. I, you know, I do believe, and I do still believe in miracles. Like Minerva said in one of my, um, and my last video is that, you know, she talked about an experience she had about um, her brother when her brother was sick and um, her getting an awesome dream from God that, you know, God was telling him, like, I did heal him, but I healed him on the heaven side, you know. And so, um, but she still believes in miracles. It, you know, I, I still believe that God can perform miracles. 
Just because I've prayed for miracles that didn't happen, that doesn't mean that I don't believe that it could happen. Like it just, that just wasn't in God's plan, in God's divine plan for, for the things that I was believing in. Um, and, and my faith isn't any less because of it. I, <laughs> I'm just questioning. I'm not necessarily questioning my faith. I just don't understand. Um, I'm just not sure if, if, if when I'm believing for something, if I may be putting doubt because I'm praying, but let your will be done. And is it okay to pray, God, let this be your will? Is it okay to pray for something that may be against God's will? Because you don't know what his will is. Like this is good and this is good, but God knows this is better. And it could be the same thing you're praying for. It could not be, but I'm praying for this. Please let this be your will. Please let your will be this and please let it be done. Like, is that what we're supposed to do? So anyways, <laughs> that's where I am with that. I'm still there. Um, but I am in no way lacking faith or saying that anybody should lose faith if they're praying or believing for something and it doesn't happen. Um, I'm I'm just trying to figure out how it all, like how to work it all together, I guess. And so that's what I'm getting out of Matthew right now is just that because there's just so many stories of faith and talking about faith so much. Um, so that's where, that's where I am. Alrighty, so we are in Matthew 19, and I'm still reading for the message version, and I didn't even open in prayer yet, so let's go ahead and do that. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us um, your word today, Lord, that we can partake of it, and we can um, fill our spirits, Lord. Please continue to water this seed that you've put inside me, Lord, that I may flourish and spread your love and your light with others, God, and that others are, are getting, getting as much as I'm getting, if not more out of this, Lord, that others that, that may be watching. And I just ask that you open our hearts today to receive um, everything that you have to offer us today from your word, Lord. And I just ask that you, that you just become more clear to us. Um, I mean, <laughs> here I go again. Maybe this is what you wanted, you know, me asking questions, me digging deeper, me asking other people about this, like that's, that's fellowship. That's, you know, iron sharpens iron. Um, this is, you know, the way that, that we're learning and, and, um, being in communion with, with each other. And so I just, I accept it, Lord, and I receive it. And I just ask that you Continue to bless this Bible study in whatever way that you see fit, God. And I just um, thank you, God. I just thank you that that I am able to do this and I'm able to share it with others. And um, just help us to have a great day. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty, so we are in Matthew 19. And I'm reading in the um, message version. So here we go. When Jesus had completed these teachings, he left Galilee and crossed the region of Judea. On the other side of the Jordan, great crowds followed him there, and he healed them. One day the Pharisees were badgering him. Is it legal for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? He answered, Haven't you read in the Bible that the Creator originally made man and woman for each other, male and female? And because of this, a man leaves his father and mother, and is firmly bonded to his wife, becoming one flesh, no longer two bodies, but one. Because God created this organic union of the two sexes, no one should desecrate his art by cutting them apart. They shot back in rebuttal. If that's so, why did Moses give instruction for divorce papers and divorce procedures? Jesus said, Moses provided for divorce as a concession to your hard-heartedness. Hard heartedness. But it is not part of God's original plan. I'm holding you to the original plan and holding you liable for adultery. If you divorce your faithful wife and then marry someone else, I make an exception in cases where the spouse has committed adultery. Ooh, message version. Interesting. Jesus' disciples objected. 
if those are the terms of marriage, we haven't got a chance. Why get married? But Jesus said, not everyone is mature enough to live in a married life. It requires a certain aptitude and grace. Hallelujah. Marriage isn't for everyone. Some from birth, seemingly, never give marriage a thought. Others never get asked or accepted. And some decide not to get married for kingdom reasons. But if you're capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. One day, children were brought to Jesus in the hope that he would lay hands on them and pray over them. The disciples shooted them off, shooed them off. But Jesus intervened, let the children alone. Don't prevent them from coming to me. God's kingdom is made up of people like these. After laying hands on them, he left. Another day, a man stopped Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you question me about what's good? God is the one who is good. If you want to enter the life of God, just do what he tells you. The man asked, What in particular? Jesus said, Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbors as you do yourself. The young man said, I've done all that. What's left? If you want to give it all you've got, Jesus replied, go sell your possessions. Give everything to the poor. All your wealth will be in heaven. Then come follow me. That was the last thing the young man expected to hear. And so, crestfallen, he walked away. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and he couldn't bear to let go. As he watched him go, Jesus told his disciples, do you have any idea how difficult it is for the rich to enter in God's kingdom? Let me tell you, it's easier to gallop a camel through a needle's eye than for the rich to enter God's kingdom. The disciples were staggered. Then who has any chance at all? Jesus looked hard at them and said, no chance at all if you think you can pull it off yourself. Every chance in the world if you trust God to do it. Then Peter chimed in. We left everything and followed you. What do we get for it? Mm -hmm. Jesus replied, yes, you have followed me in the recreation of the world when the son of man will rule gloriously. You who have followed me will also rule, starting with the 12 tribes of Israel. And not only you, but anyone who sacrifices home, family, fields, whatever, because of me, will get it all back a hundred times over, not to, mention, not to mention the considerable bonus of eternal life. This is the great reversal, many of the first ending up last, and the last first. I want to read that real fast, not real fast, but I want to go through that in the um, New International Version, just because I want to see the translation. Okay. So I'm starting back, um, Matthew 19, verse 1, and this is the New International Version. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee. And went, I like how oh, the New International Version actually has the red letters. The, the, um, the message version doesn't, obviously, because it's a more dramatized. It's not his words. Okay. Um, large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that in the beginning, the creator made the male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Got some notes here. I was just giving, um, reference back to where that came from. So those are both from Genesis. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives 
because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciple said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry. Not every, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has given. I'm sorry. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. Um, verse 11. Jesus replies, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are... On, onyx who were born that way and there are onyx who have been made onyx by others and there are those who chose to live like onyx for the sake of the kingdom of heaven the one who can accept this should accept it see that's different that's different than what the message version says this this one says the one who accept, who can accept this should accept it. And he's talking about being single. But in the message version, it says that if you can be married and follow all the rules, then you should be married, right? Is that Am I interpreting those correctly? I think, okay. I don't, I don't know what unic means, but I think it's being single. See, and then if we go back to the message version in that last... Um, verse in that section, it says, I can't say. it says, um, but if you are capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. Huh, that's interesting. I wonder if we look at the uh, New Living Translation. What does that one say? Let anyone who accepts this, who can, it says, some are born. As to unex, that's what it says here. For the sake of the kingdom of heaven, let anyone accept it who can. That's interesting. Let me know if I'm not interpreting that right, but I'm pretty sure that's what it's what I got. That's what it said. Okay. Um, verse 13, chapter 19, verse 13. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Then, just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to mm -hmm. enter life, Keep the commandments. Which one, he required, he, he inquired, Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and who are last will be first. 
All right, let's go into chapter 20, and I'm going to switch back to the message. All right. God's kingdom is like an estate manager who went out early. God's kingdom is like an estate manager who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. They agreed on a wage of a dollar a day and went to work. Later, about nine o'clock, the manager saw some other men hanging around the town square, unemployed. He told them go to work in his vineyard and he would pay them a fair wage. They went. He did the same thing at noon and then again at three o'clock. At five o'clock, he went back and still found others standing around. He said, why are you standing around all day doing nothing? They said, because no one hired us. He told them go to work in his vineyard. When the day's work was over, the owner of the vineyard instructed his foreman, call the workers in and pay them their wages. Start with the last hired and then go to the first. Those hired at five o'clock came up and were each given a dollar. When those who were hired first saw that, they assumed they would get far more. But they got the same. Each of them one dollar. Taking the dollar, they groused angrily to the manager. These last, hold on, these last workers put in only one easy hour. And you just made them equal to us, who slaved all day under the scorching sun? He replied to the one, speaking for the rest. Friend, I haven't been unfair. We agreed on a wage of a dollar, didn't we? So, take it and go. I decided to give the one who came last the same Mom! as you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Are you going to be stingy because I'm generous? Here it is again, the great reversal. Many of the first ending up last and the last first. Jesus, now well on the way up to Jerusalem, took off, took the twelve off to the side of the road and said, Listen to me carefully. We are on our way up to Jerusalem. When we get there, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the religious leaders and scholars. They will sentence him to death. They will then hand him over to the Romans for mockery and torture and crucifixion. On the third day, he will be raised up alive. He, didn't he tell him this already? It was about that time that the mother of Zebedee brothers, of the Zebedee brothers, came with her two sons and knelt down before Jesus with a request. What do you want? Jesus asked. She said, give your word that these two sons of mine will be awarded the highest places and honor in your kingdom, one at your right hand and one at your left. Jesus responded, you have no idea what you're asking. And he said to James and John, are you capable of drinking the cup I am about to drink? They said, sure, why not? Jesus said, come to think of it. You are going to drink my cup, but as to awarding places of honor, that's not my business. My father is taking care of that. When the ten others heard about this, they lost their tempers, thoroughly disgusted with the two brothers. So Jesus got them down, got them together to settle things down. He said, You observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, how quickly a little power goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for the many who are held hostage. As they were leaving Jericho, a huge crowd followed them. Suddenly, they came upon two blind men sitting alongside the road. When they heard it was Jesus passing, they cried out, Master, have mercy on us. Mercy, Son of David. The crowd tried to hush them up, but they got all the louder, crying, Master, have mercy on us. Mercy, son of David. Jesus stopped and called over. What do you want from me? They said, Master, we want our eyes open. We want to see. Deeply moved, Jesus touched their eyes. They had their sight back that very instant and joined in the procession. Okay, let's read that in a minute.
So this is chapter 20, and we're on verse 1 of the New International Version. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them. You know, this story, I, okay, I understood it in the message version, this story. Do I, if that was me, if this was work, I get it. But with this being the kingdom of God, I get it too. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, you know, like, who am I? I'm not better than any other. I'm not better than anyone, any other sinner out there, you know, like, because I came to the Lord first and I've been doing good longer than, than sinners who, who are still sitting, but tomorrow, maybe they're not, you know, like tomorrow, I mean, not, not sitting, but maybe tomorrow they, they find the Lord and they're saved. And I still don't consider myself any better than them, you know, like, so I, I get that. But I, but in the work aspect, I get like, dude, I've been working all day. Why I shouldn't get the same pay as them. I mean, I deal with that. I deal with that at work. Sorry, hold on. Okay, so I don't think I'm even going to read through that part of it. Maybe. Okay, I just want to see. Okay, let's. The workers who were hired. I want to read what the end of this says. Um, okay, so let me start. Let me start at verse 9. The workers who were hired about 5 in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. Right, sorry, I need to start going to Starbucks or something. We do my Bible study apparently. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm on verse 13 in New International, but he answered one of them. I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Oh, see the title of this next part says Jesus predicts his death a third time. So this is, does this mean that he told this is the third time he told me? Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Then the mother of Zebedee, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. Grant that one of, my, of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in the kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink of the cup I am about to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them. You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right and left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not, did not come to be served, but to serve 
and did not give his life as a ransom for many. And to give his life as a ransom for many. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. They believed and it happened. They believed for a miracle. They knew that the Lord could heal them. He had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. They immediately received their sight and followed him. I missed that part. They left. They left and followed him. That's cool. Um, all right. So we're going to stop there for today. We'll start 21 tomorrow. Leave any comments that you have to say. Um, and I hope you're getting notifications of my videos. And thank you for your time. And I hope you all have a blessed day. And, okay. and don't let anyone take your joy. <laughs>